Anyways, let me get started. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to get offended if you guys uh, choose to leave the room. Uh, so don't worry about that. If you feel that you want to leave, that's perfectly OK. Some of you have a piece of paper, and the idea is that you can write your thoughts there, uh, thoughts about the presentation, thoughts about what I'm writing here, questions. And I would like you guys to you know, just give me those papers uh, and share, you know, give them to me. If you want to say that uh, we did something good, write it down, or something bad, write it down. Any of your thoughts, uh, put them there, and I'll be very happy to read them. Uh, so we won't be able to go through your papers here, so just write any thoughts that you have on that piece of paper, and I'll, I'll read them later. So uh, the purpose of this talk is, uh, is to discuss how to integrate your c -sharp code with iOS native libraries. And this is an important topic. Um, it's a relatively low-level topic, so um, so again, well, so it's a relatively low-level topic. We're going to discuss when you want to bind, how you bind those APIs, and how to improve the binding. A lot of the focus on this talk is really about improving the binding. So I'm going to get the basics out of the very, very quickly. So, uh, so that way you'll, you'll get an idea, and, 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 and maybe you can think about those. So the, what it means to interrupt with iOS, with Xamarin iOS, is that you want to consume either Objective-C libraries that are object-oriented libraries that exist on the system, or you want to integrate with C libraries. There's a large collection of C libraries out in the world. Uh, C++ libraries can be easily exposed as C APIs, right? Um, and that's the idea. Those are the two universes uh, that you typically want to talk to when, when using uh, C Sharp. The purpose of this talk really is about the first one, how to consume Objective-C libraries. We're not going to talk about C code, because there's a lot written about that. We just use the standard .NET P invoke mechanism. So Microsoft has written a lot of documentation. All of that documentation applies. Uh, there's hundreds of examples. There's even a website called pinvoke.net. So we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about how to blend the Objective-C world with the C-sharp world. So you're going to be using this if you found some incredible control on GitHub that there's no component for, or if you have some legacy code in your company that was built with Objective-C that you want to bring, or you want to blend two worlds together. Um, and uh, the most important thing is that, uh, about this is that every single thing that we're going to cover today is actually what we use to build Xamarin iOS itself, right? So every API that you use with Xamarin iOS has been built with the technology that we're going to discuss today. So it's the exact, what? And Xamarin Mac, and Xamarin Mac. So, it is the same technology. So everything that you're going to be using is the same stuff that we use. Um, so you're going to get at the same level of quality in the bindings. So um, well, I already kind of covered this. So consuming C libraries, that's platform invoke. So the way that you integrate Objective-C libraries is with a thing called a binding project. And what you want to do is you want to map the Objective-C concepts, classes, methods, fields, and so on into c -sharp concepts, right? So we're going to learn a little bit today about Objective-C, about the data types that we'll encounter in Objective-C, and how those things translate to c -sharp. And the way that you do it is that you're going to create a binding project in either Visual Studio or Xamarin Studio, and you're going to create this definition, and we're going to talk about that. So, um, so the way that this works is that this objective binding, you will describe, what you're going to do is you're going to describe the Objective-C API uh, you're effectively, you're describing the Objective-C API, but you're annotating it with strong type information, right? Uh, Objective-C is a dynamic language, and it has some amount of uh, type safety, only some amount of type safety. They have types, but arrays are untyped, dictionaries are untyped, sets are untyped. There's a whole collection of APIs that expose untyped uh, uh, untype, uh, uh, variables and properties. So what we're going to do is basically we're going to take this untyped version and we're going to add type information. We're going to turn just uh, C defines that have no type information into strongly typed enums that can be used with IntelliSense and code completion, right? So that's what we're going to do. And the last thing that you want to do is we want to extend uh, some of the Objective-C. Uh, you're going to translate some Objective-C idioms into c -sharp idioms. Now, just to get things out of the way uh, very quickly, if you're not really interested in the nitty-gritty details, my friend Aaron Bokover sitting on the front row has created a tool called Objective Sharpie that is available as of today. Objective Sharpie is this cute little app uh, 
you run it. It's a, it's a, um, it, it's a wizard. Um, you configure the application. You say what kind of thing, what kind of API you want to bind, right? It's going to be an iOS API. It's going to be a macOS API. Then you configure, you select the header files that you want to, 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 to bind. So in this case, I'm going to take Cocos 2D, right? So the Cocos 2D API, but it could be anything. It could be some GitHub project that you just downloaded. You add that thing. Then you select what namespace you want this output it on, right? So you downloaded something from, object, uh, from GitHub. You set the namespace. You configure the output file, and it generates the binding, and you're done. That's it. Uh, if that's all you want to have, if you want to have a bare minimum project, you take that file and you put it into that iOS binding project, and you're done. You have a C Sharp API to Objective C, and we're done. There's really no more to it. Now, uh, that doesn't really create a high quality binding. That gives you direct raw access to Objective C, but it doesn't give, it's not going to give your users code completion. It's not going to give them strong types. It's not going to give them type safety, right? So there's going to be, so what we're going to talk for the rest uh, of today is how do we turn an API that is relatively loosely typed into a strongly typed API and how we can make the life of your users nicer. Um, one, of the <coughs> one of the things that you're going to do is you're going to want to rename Objective-C methods um, into methods that conform to the .NET design framework guidelines, right? Objective-C has this idiom where methods uh, are actually constructed from their parameter names. So you th you, they say things like, sort, array, using, uh, ascending, by, order, right? So that's a method name that doesn't really make a lot of sense in C Sharp. In C Sharp, since we have operator overloading, we just call that method sort, and that's it. And then we name the parameters. But we don't need to make our, 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 our method name sort, data, by, array, using. We don't need to do that. We want a short name, or we want a name that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about that. So to create a good binding, what we're going to do is it actually comes in three pieces. The first piece contains enumerations and structures. We're going to be using this particular bit to turn uh, Objective-C enums that are typically untyped, right? So they have, for example, text alignment, right? UI text alignment. Um, and it can be left, center, right. So if you're using an Objective-C, what you would have is UI text alignment left, UI text alignment center, UI text alignment right. Those are three constants. The problem with those three constants is that they actually are not very useful alone, because you can just reference it that way in Objective-C. What we want in the c -sharp world is actually we're going to take that prefix, UI text alignment, and we're going to make that the enumeration, and then we're going to make the fields left, center, and right. So the way that your source code is going to look is going to be UI text alignment, left, UI text alignment, center, right? So that's what's going to be contained in the enumeration uh, piece, and we'll see a little bit more of that later. The second piece is the c -sharp definition. That's going to be generated by the objective Sharpie, right? So that will be done for you. And then comes the most interesting piece, which are the curated extensions. How to make your Objective C API uh, expose C sharp idioms, uh, things like enumerators, things like uh, uh, things like adding add methods, so you can create C sharp uh, constructors and stuff like that uh, that are very convenient. So let's look at a very simple Objective C API. This is very very simple, and the idea here is to teach you what you're going to be looking at and how you would improve the API. So what we're defining here is a class called Magic Beans. And Magic Beans subclasses NS object. You're going to find this everywhere in Objective C. Right? This is creating a new class. It's equivalent of saying in C Sharp, class Magic Beans. And remember, in C Sharp, it's always implied, the, the base class is always implied. And uh, what we have here is we have one constructor, which, is, which follows this pattern. It's init with string, and it takes a parameter of type NS string. In Objective-C, constructors are actually created by convention, right? So the convention is that if the, it's an instance method. Everything that you see with a minus sign means instance method. So the convention is that the instant method called init and whatever else comes later is a constructor. Um, it poses a problem because if people don't follow conventions and they don't properly call base classes, you get corrupt state. So it's, 
It's a common bug in Objective-C applications. The second method, it's a static method because it contains a plus sign. The plus sign says this is a static method. Uh, it returns an NS array. Uh, it's called get all beans. Uh, what is interesting about this is that there, you don't really know what the return type of get all beans is. You just know that it's an array. And it might contain anything. It contains strings, or maybe it contains magic beans. We actually don't know. Could be either one of those. Uh, there's a method called grow. <coughs> and there's a method that takes a parameter called harvest. So that's the definition. Uh, so let's take a look at what a C sharp definition generated by uh, Objective Sharpie would be. Uh, oh, there's a bug there. Oh, there's a bug. Let me fix that bug right away. Okay. So. The way, the way that the, the, the contract that we're going to use to express the, C, the, the Objective C um, API in C Sharp is actually written in C Sharp. So we're using C Sharp itself to express this. And we're using the word interface. And, and the reason we're doing that uh, has to do because, um, what was the reason for that? There's a good reason. Right, because we were going to have base classes that could be abstract. So that's why we need to do that. So, um, so we're going to kill an interface magic bean. And there's a couple of things that I want you to notice. There's this attribute called export. And export contains a string. And the string matches each one of these names that we used on the left side. Those names that you see in export, they're called selectors in Objective-C. Those things are called selectors. Uh, and we'll get more into that later. Um, what is interesting here is that we are actually making it very explicit that this init with something is actually a constructor by using the special signature in pointer constructor. That is an idiom in the IDEA language. That's always a constructor. And then notice that we replace n string with string, with a C sharp string. Okay? The binding tool takes care of transforming between n string and string. And you should do this because the runtime has special uh, support for doing this marshalling. And you will get zero copy marshalling if you do this. So do this because it's the best thing that you can do. Now notice that the get all beans method, uh, it uses a new attribute called static. It's saying this is a static method. So that's how you add a static method. Uh, the reason why you can't use a C-sharp static word is because remember we're creating an interface, not a class. It's an interface, right? So it's a static method. And uh, notice that instead of returning an NS array, it returns magic beans. It returns a strongly typed magic bean array. The way that I found that out is I either looked at the source code for the library, or I actually went and looked at the documentation. And perhaps I wrote a test, right? So I found out that that particular method would always return instances of magic beans. Uh, the effect that this has is that now on the ID, when you say get all beans, uh, square bracket number, close square bracket, dot, you'll get code completion for all the methods available there. So that's why that matters. Uh, then we have a simple method grow, and then we have the last one. And this is actually showing you uh, how to bind the NS date time. Oh, damn it, there's another bug. Let me fix that one right quick. How did, how did this? Who hired this idiot? All right. Whew. Okay. Now, Let's look at how this is actually built. So the result of this whole process of binding a library is going to be magicbeans.dll. That's all you're going to have. At the end of the day, you end up with a DLL, magicbeans.dll, that contains everything you need. That's all you can give. That's what you give your users. That's what you consume uh, yourself. That's what you give other team members. You just give them a DLL. And it's actually made up of a couple of interesting pieces. The native library that comes from the project. So this libmagicbeans.a is the Objective-C native library. This is the native library that comes in the system. Um, and that is blended with your enumeration structures, with c -sharp definition, and curated extensions, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but essentially what happens is that we collect all these data, we generate the thing, and we produce a self-contained DLL. And that's all you have to worry about. So, yes? If I thought that you gave somebody who didn't have the, the list, yes. but they already have it, yeah. You don't need to distribute the libmagicbeans.a. That is the beautiful thing about this. You, you, you just give me a DLL. That's it. In fact, all the components on the components are use this technique. Uh, you download it. You don't even know it. But there's a static library inside. OK? OK. So, um, so 
how does Objective Sharpie work? It actually uses LVM's Objective C compiler to parse the API. So it's the same compiler that Apple uses. It scans your API and it applies all of the rules. We have a set of conventions and .NET coding guidelines, frameworks, et cetera, et cetera, and it does all the work for you. Um, and then you have to modify it. That is a URL for the Objective C Sharpie tool. So you can get it today, you can download it. It's a dot my app. What? I know. No, no. You gave me that URL and I created that link. Because I'm efficient. Oh, well, maybe I wanted to get the credit for that URL. I don't think you gave me that. Anyways, get my link, don't get his. All right, basics of bindings. So this is a good time if you figure that's all I need to do. I don't really care about the quality of the binding. Now you can go. It's fine. That's the end of it. Now we're going to talk about how to impro improve your binding and spice it up to be, to be a first-class .NET citizen and actually take advantage of everything that, um, that Objective-C has. So we're going to talk about a different uh, set of pieces. Uh, Objective-C supports classes. They're very similar to c -sharp classes. There's really no magic there. Objective-C supports a thing called protocols. And protocols are like interfaces, c -sharp interfaces, except that they have optional methods. So they can say, yeah, I know it's an interface, but if you don't feel like implementing this method, don't implement it, which poses a couple of problems for us, because c -sharp is not very happy with that. So I'll teach you how to bind that. Uh, we're going to bind methods. We're going to bind properties. And when we talk about that, we're going to talk about how you map the types from Objective-C to C-sharp. Again, if you don't care much about the binding, you can just leave. It's fine. But we're going to talk about how to improve it. We're going to talk about delegate classes, exposing weak and strong types, and binding blocks. Blocks are callbacks. They're like delegates in, uh, in C-sharp. So these are essentially the basics. Uh, this is a cheat sheet that you can use. On your IDL definition, if you, want, if you find something in Objective-C that says interface full column bar, that means that it's a class declaration. And in our language, what it, uh, the way that we have to write it is base type, type of bar class full. And that's the equivalent of a C-sharp class. When you adopt protocols, this is like um, adopting, like implementing an interface. But remember, protocols are these weak interfaces. They're not really interfaces. They are these things that are not really finished. Um, so the syntax that you'll find is this, uh, is this angle bracket. And the way that you implement it is you list it as a base class. Oh, that's not me. So you list it as a base class. Um, for protocols, uh, when you're defining a protocol, the way that we're mapping that is by using base type, type of bar, and then you add the attribute model. So you just put the word model, and that will do it for you. And categories are actually uh, Objective-C way of saying, um, uh, are Objective-C's way of, uh, of doing extension methods. So uh, peop you'll, you'll find this, this thing. It says interface foo cute. And what it's actually doing is adding extension methods to the class foo. And what you're going to do is that just becomes a c -sharp extension method. So we just translate it directly. Should yes, they should. You're correct. Sorry. It was too embarrassing for me to fix another slide again. But I'll do it. I'll do it just for you, because you're correct. This is a bug. Yes? All right. Well, you'll get me. You'll get me the right one. One second. So this is all fine. So we're doing this live, like uh, Bill O'Reilly. All right. So. Yes, they're all going to be available. Yes, 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 yes. The problem is that the video is going to be embarrassing. That's the problem. <laughs> that is going to be the problem. OK. And that's going to make fun of me. And oh, and I clicked the wrong button. OK, let me just do this. And the video is going to be available. It's going to be embarrassing. OK. So let's look at, a, 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 at an Objective-C selector, right? This is a selector. Uh, we already saw that the minus meant instance and plus meant static. Then, in parentheses, it contains a return type. Then it contains a selector name and uh, a semicolon. So this is a very, very simple one. And this is how you bind it. You just say get number. That's it. 
Now let's look at, uh, uh, let's take a look at one a little bit more interesting. Uh, this one is a static method that returns a float, uh, and the method is called add colon int first and colon int second. The way that you invoke this is by saying in Objective C, add three space and four. So that's what you actually write. You say add three and four, those four words. Um, so what is interesting here is that the way that you have to think about this is that the type declarations after the, col the, 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 the columns should be gone. So remove the type declaration and the, and the parameter name, right? So you end up with add, and then you end up with the second word and, right? And that's a selector for this method. So internally, Objective-C, the way that it calls methods is by generating these strings. So selectors are actually just strings. Right, so when you call a method in Objective-C, you actually pass a string and say, hey, call the thing that matches this string, right? Um, so this is the selector name, add and colon. And that's how you would bind it in Objective-C. You would say float add in first, comma, in second. Property selectors, uh, the way that you would find it is uh, that you would see in the source code something like add property, read write, or read only, in foo. Uh, this is a read write property, which means that you should have a getter and a setter. Uh, it returns an int. And what actually the compiler does in Objective-C is that it generates two methods for you. It generates a, it generates a, um, it generates a get foo and it generates a set foo, right? Set foo with a colon, and it uppercases the letter, right? You don't need to know this. I'm just telling you that as a, some background to know what's going on behind the scenes. The way that you bind is just say export foo, get, and set, and that's it. So uh, every once in a while, if you're doing some manual work and you're not using Objective Sharpie, it is possible that you get your selectors wrong. You could get your selectors wrong. I've done it a bunch of times. I got my selector wrong, and uh, Nat mocked me for that. So what you can do is you should create a unit test. Um, as part of your unit test framework, you create a unit test. All you have to do with a standard monotouch unit test is subclass this special class called API constructor init test. Let me show you how it's done. And that will ensure that all of your selectors are tested, right? So this is all you have to do to check your API for a particular API. So you just do this, and it will scan all of your types and make sure that every method that you specify can be invoked and, and, and is present to your assembly. So let's talk a little bit about the data type uh, mapping now. You're going to find a number of data types in Objective-C, and we want to map those into C-sharp. Um, so the left column shows what you'll find in the source code. The C-sharp, uh, the right column shows what you want to use in C-sharp. So you got bool and GL boolean. You translate those to bool. And a string star, you should use a C-sharp string, or sometimes you use an N string. And let me tell you when you use one over the other. There are a few very specific cases where the string is not actually used as a string, so it's not really a string, it's a token, it's a magic token. So every once in a while, Apple uses uh, a constant, an N string constant, as a key into a dictionary or as a pointer that they can't compare. So they don't actually compare the contents of the strings, they compare them as pointers. These are typically tokens that you use in notifications, for example. So notifications use strings as tokens. So that is the only case where you would use any string in notification tokens, or for example, when you register identifiers with things like UI table view cell. So that's why you find sometimes, very rarely, an any string in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in the bindings. Char pointers are, you should just decorate them with the plain string attribute and then string, and the, 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 the binding generator will take care of the binding. And as integer and as you integer, they convert to int and you int. Uh, these three data types, CG Rec, CG Point, and CG Sites, come from Core Graphics. So it's the foundation that paints on iOS. They are mapped to system drawing, the equivalent types of system drawing. ID is the magic object in Objective C that represents an object. So every time you see ID, you can replace it with NS object. The special word SEL uppercase becomes an Objective Runtime C selector. And this other funny type, Dispatch QT, becomes Core Foundation Dispatch Q. That is, uh, it, that's called Grand Central Dispatch. It's a data type core to Grand Central Dispatch on, on, on iOS. 
and GL float and GL float becomes floats. This is pretty much all the mappings that you need to be aware of. Now let's talk about arrays. <coughs> Uh, like I said, NS arrays are untyped. They're similar to the old uh, .NET data types. Um, if you've been around for a while, you remember array list, you remember hash table. Uh, so it's the equivalent of that. We don't want that. We d want the equivalent of list of T, and we want the equivalent of a dictionary of T. So what you have to do, like I said, you can just say, I'm okay with NS array. I'll just walk out. Um, it's fine with me. But if you want to do a better job, what you need to do is look up what the array is supposed to be, either in the documentation or the source code, and replace it with the right, uh, with the right data type. That really is, that's really all you need to know about binding data types in Objective-C. So let's talk about linking libraries. So like I mentioned before, one of the nice things about uh, doing this, uh, this DLL is that you give your, your users the DLL, it contains the public contract specification, it, con it contains the binding, and it contains the, 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 the native code. Um, it's not like, uh, like Objective-C where you give them a bunch of header files, an A file, and instructions for how to drag and drop that stuff into the project and link it. So, so, uh, so what you wanna do to uh, deliver that experience is you need to use uh, this special attribute in your assembly. You need to put this attribute that says assembly colon link with and then you'll specify there's a number of parameters that link with uh, has uh, that you need to fill. Luckily, it's all strongly typed, so when you type them, the ID is gonna tell you what they are. So all you have to do is start typing and it will tell you what they are. Let me tell you what the important things are. There are three parameters that you can pass. Uh, the frameworks, so if your library depends on some frameworks, this is required on iOS. So if you downloaded a great library from the network that requires core media, then you need to list, in, you need to say frameworks equals core media, right? There's optional libraries that you, would, you might, you might want to consume. For example, something that just came out in iOS 6. Uh, what would that be a good example? What just came out in iOS 6? Newstand kit, right? If you want to use the Newstand APIs, you want to list it as a weak framework. And the idea is uh, you only list it as weak framework if your application can optionally use a feature or not. So if the library that you're linking happens to detect that, weak frame, uh, that Newstand kit is there, it uses it, and if it's not there, it doesn't use it, uh, you would use a weak framework. And you can also pass uh, flags to the linker. So you can pass any flags to the native linker here. Um, so that's it. The other thing that you want to do for your native library is you want to make sure that, uh, um, ideally, you want to make sure that you, you have a, a native library that contains a simulator code and at least one native platform. Um, not everybody does this. Uh, a lot of people just give you one of those and you're supposed to build your own. Uh, good, libraries, good libraries will contain fat code and it will contain an x86 binary, uh, ARM, ARMv6, ARMv7. To improve the tooling, what you need to do is, uh, is you need to specify which one of those uh, uh, native backends exist. You don't really need to worry about this. When you drag and drop your, your, your static library into Xamarin Studio, it figures it out and it puts it in. But if you upgrade the library, you might need to manually say, oh, I added a version that has ARMv7. So you need to edit the flags and add ARMv7. Uh, and like I said, the IDE will do this for you. So if you take your native library and drag and drop it into Xamarin Studio, it will inspect the binary and do the whole link with for, for you. I'm just saying, you might, you might need to eventually tune it up or change or make adjustments. <coughs> now, starting with the version that we shipped uh, just this week, we introduced uh, a feature called Smart Link. And what happened is that in the past, I talked about this and uh, what is new in iOS, but what happened in the past is that we didn't really know which methods you were gonna call in the native library. We didn't have support to know that. So what we did is when you linked the native library, we just took the entire native library and we shipped it with your application. Uh, that means that if you called any method, it will work, right? Because all the library was there. But it's possible that this was a very large library that you, that you consumed, and, and it might contain 100 controls, and you only use one or two. And we still ship the other 98. So that's what we did historically. Now, we have an, now you can opt in into Smart Link. Um, all you need to do, it's a new flag, so you just say on link with, you say Smart Link, and what it's, it's gonna do is it's actually going to only include the pieces that you use. It's an opt-in feature because some Objective-C code is, um, 
some Objective-C code is dynamic, and they like to call methods that cannot be determined statically. What that means is that they are just going to call stuff, and the, the linker has no way of knowing that you're going to call it, right? And it's just going to fail at runtime. So it is rare, but it's a practice that some of the most uh, um, kind of the more dynamic kind of people are using. It's very rare, but it exists. So that's why it's, a, it's an opt-in feature. But once you opt into this feature, uh, you see that this sample that actually, uh, that actually consumes a lot of the code actually reduces the size of your executable. Now, the samples that we use exercise a lot of the library, so the gains are not as big. But even in these cases, you see a win, right? It would be more pronounced if you're bringing 20 controls and you're using just one. So that's the effect of smart link. Uh, I showed this slide yesterday on what is new on iOS, um, and you can see that it's roughly between 300K and 400K for a lot of these samples. Okay, let's talk a little bit about advanced um, features of bindings. So we already covered the basics of doing classes and protocols. Now, there's a couple of other things that you'll find. You'll find that every once in a while, Objective-C APIs declare global variables, and they're used as tokens. Remember I mentioned that NSString token? that are used as magic values. Uh, so when you find those things, um, what, the way that you bind it is by introducing uh, this attribute called field. And the field attribute takes the name of the Objective-C variable, right? You need to use a special underscore, underscore internal, second parameter. And then you just create a getter and setter. Um, you use the setter if you want to change the value. Otherwise, it will be just a read-only. Uh, there's only a few types supported for these special global variables. Those are NS array, NS string, the list that you see there, ends, doubles, floats, and uh, size Fs. The other thing that you want to do, <clears throat> uh, one of the APIs that uh, takes these tokens is the notification center API. So anything that has the word notification as a public variable needs to use an NS string. Um, and the way that notifications are delivered in iOS is, uh, is um, is that you post messages into this hub. The notification center is a, is a messaging hub in iOS. And, the, and what happens is that when you want to broadcast a message, you say, well, I want to uh, post a message, for example, um, connected to the network, and then you pass uh, a parameter, for example, on Wi-Fi or on Ethernet or, well, not Ethernet. Well, Ethernet is fine. So Wi-Fi, Ethernet, 3G, right? So it's, that's a parameter. You post that, and if there are any listeners, they'll get the message delivered. Right, if there's no listeners, nothing happens. On the other end of, on the other, uh, on the other side of the house, though, what you do is you register to listen to this key. You say, "I want to listen to network connected events," and this is the this is the code to be invoked when that happens. So when that happens, uh, you get that message and the payload, and the payload was either 3G or Wi-Fi or the other parameter that I talked about. So, again, here, a, a big point of this is to improve the quality of the binding for your users. So what you want to do is you want to make it simpler for your users to actually find the notification. So you don't want them to have to go to the documentation to find the name of the notification. You don't want them to have to look up the keys and values for the dictionaries that are passed. And you don't want them to have to, uh, to look up what the payload values are. So um, I mentioned uh, this in the keynote. This is an example, um, uh, NS file handle. So basically, what you will find when you bind notifications is that we create a subclass called notifications in your class. So if you have NS file handle notifications, you'll get a notification subclass. And then there's going to be a collection of methods that begin with the word observe. So observe and the name of the notification. So in this case, uh, this is going to observe the fact that reading has completed. And it's going to take two parameters. They're strongly typed as well. So you get code completion there, right? So in this particular case, uh, the arguments contain a Unix error, in case there was an error during reading, and the available data, which is an NS data object, right? So the nice thing is, again, these are strongly typed values. And uh, to stop listening to notification, you call this post. So how does this work? Uh, so again, you don't have to do this. It's completely optional, but it helps uh, uh, build things for your users. The way that you do it is that you create an interface and notice that this one has no register and has no export. It's a plain interface, right? It has no decoration. Um, and you say, these are going to be the, uh, the parameters that my notification is going to get. So I'm going to call this NS file handle read event args. I'm following the .NET convention of using event args for event arguments payload. Then I'm going to 
list on the export the actual keys. You're going to find this in the documentation. The documentation is going to say these are the keys, and these are the return data types. So again, you're putting the burden of l reading the documentation on you, uh, not on your users. So you put that one there, um, and then you put the resulting uh, data there. Uh, and then the only thing that you have to do is the fields that you had declared before, you just put this notification attribute. So here you can see how I had bound a field before. It, it said field NS file handle read completion notification. And then all I did is I say I used the notification attribute and I say this notification is going to get these types as a parameter. So NS file handle read event args. And that's it. That generates the whole binding for you. And this is the code that is generated. Uh, when you use this, it basically generates this. Public static and a subject observe read completion. An event handler, and it takes the, and it takes the strong type that we just defined. Um, and then you can consume it in that way. We've also added support for async. Uh, this, is available on the, this is available both on the stable and the beta. It just happens that you can't use a magic await keyboard on the stable version, but you can still use it with the TPL API. Uh, and all you have to do is you can apply the async attribute to any method that has a callback delegate at the end. It can be a delegate, it can be an action, so action of whatever, you can use it there, or you can use a delegate or a custom method name. If you put the async uh, attribute there, it's gonna do two things. It's gonna still generate the standard method declaration, right? So it's gonna generate foo of arc, arc2, whatever. So the same API is still there, but it's also gonna generate another method, which is the async version of the method. Uh, the difference is that this one returns a task object instead of void and uh, has the, uh, the, the suffix async. And you'll notice that there's no callback at the end. What's going to happen is that when you invoke this method, the callback will be, will be resumed on the thread that made the invocation. Uh, like I mentioned yesterday on the iOS, what is new on iOS, the uh, all async, as long as you're concerned, will always resume execution in your current thread. If you call that in the main thread, uh, on the main UA thread, you'll resume execution in the main thread. If you're calling it from a Grand Central Dispatch queue, it will resume in the same Grand Central Dispatch queue later. Now let's talk a little bit about how to curate your extension. So the kind of things that you wanna do, there's this very nice feature in C Sharp where when you create an object, where you say new uh, class you open parenthesis, close parenthesis. If you open a brace and you add parameters, it will, invo it will cr create your object and then repeatedly call the add method for you. So this leads to very nice uh, source code. Um, let, me, let me show you, uh, let me show you, where's my Emacs? Where is my Emacs? Where's my Emacs? Oh, there it is. So, um, um, This allows you to do things like this. So, for ex whoa, that is a very small font. Um. Oh, I can do that. I can't do that. <gasps> Does it take a dash? Damn it, how do I do that? What? No, this is Emacs. It's not going to work. So I'm going to... Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, I can do that. Oh, the Macintosh does that for me. <gasps> it's magical. Oh, good Lord. Emacs has taken over my keyboard. Uh, I don't think it's going to... No, I can do that. Um, so file, open solution, uh, CVS, MT, monotouch, so dialog, uh, close project, then add remove. Uh, where is this puppy? Here. So what adding the add method does to your code is it allows you to write this sort of thing, right? It allows you to call the constructor here, pass the parameters to the constructor, and then open brace, 
and then you have all of the all of these all of these uh, uh, these objects just get repeatedly sent using an add method. Right. So if you have an add method in your class, it will just call it. So it's very nice for initialization. You can initialize objects in a very nice way. Um, so that's why you want to add an add method. Um, you also want to expose some higher level APIs. Every once in a while, the Objective-C APIs are a little bit low level, so you might want to spice that up. Uh, you want to expose strongly type APIs for dictionaries, so we'll cover how to do that. Objective-C developers like to pass NS dictionaries, which is a little bit of a cop-out. Um, so the way that you configure a lot of APIs is you pass a dictionary. There's no information about what's in the dictionary. You have to look it up in the documentation. You need to know what the keys are and what the, the types of the, of the values should be. If you get them wrong, typically you don't get a, a, an error. Typically you don't get a warning. Typically things just mysteriously fail. Uh, we had a user that, uh, uh, that was complaining. He was using the, the, um, the loosely typed API, and he's like, well, this thing is, I, I did everything right, and my audio is recording at 22 kilohertz instead of 44. What is going on? And it's also mono instead of stereo. Uh, it's everything is right, and it turns out that he used the wrong data type for configuring his stream, right? So when you get these things wrong, you end up with bugs that are very hard to chase. It's very hard to chase why, you know, six months later, everything you've been recording turns out that it was in mono, uh, and the reason is because there were weak types. There's no typing, there's no checking, right? So you want to provide your users with strongly typed APIs. You want to implement two strings, and maybe you want to implement iterators and enumerable so that you can integrate with link. If you implement iEnumerable, you'll make any of your objects be able to, to send objects back that you can use with link. So um, the most simple thing, this is a very simple uh, iterator in this particular case. My example is probably not the best one because an array is already enumerable, but that gives you an idea. If you had any other data source or any Objective-C iterators that you would need to go through, uh, you would basically be able to yield everything from an enumerator. So what you do is that you put this code in your extensions file, in your curated API file. So you add all of this code. Um, and that's what you would do. So you should do that stuff. Then let's look at NS Dictionary and options. Um, like I said, it has a lot of problems because it introduces bugs and it requires a lot of trips of the documentation. So the way that we do it is, uh, so what we want to do it is provide strong types for every time that iOS says, hey, just pass a dictionary with options, we're, well, we're gonna look at the documentation and see what it says. And there's gonna be a section in the documentation or in the source code that's gonna say, well, this dictionary takes these keys and these values. Uh, and what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna do the work for our user. And we built a, little, a, a, few, a few things that are gonna help you do that. Um, and I'll show you what, how in a second. So this is the difference. Um, this is what the experience for your user will be. In this particular case, uh, I'm configuring some audio settings, right? And if you get any of these things wrong, that's when the errors happen. If you get a typo, if you get the wrong key, uh, uh, sometimes people are tempted to not use those constants, AV audio settings, AV encoded bit rate key. Sometimes you go, they, they went to stock overflow and they found a sample that just had a string. They copy pasted it and the string is wrong. So, uh, so that's what happens. In this particular case, I'm configuring the audio mixer output. Um, and See, what's happening there is I'm creating a dictionary. The, the first key is PCM is float. So I'm saying I'm going to configure that the data types in my buffer are float values. And then I pass an NS number of 1. Um, then I'm saying uh, that the bitrate key should be 44K. And this is where one of the bugs for a user was. Uh, with strong types, on the other hand, what, you, what we created is we created a class called audio settings, right? And we made our AV asset, uh, AV, AV asset reader audio mix output they can take an NS dictionary, or they can take the strong type version. So we want to prefer the strong type version. Um, and this class that we're going to generate allows you to type indirectly the values that you want. What is nice, again, is you get code completion. So when you're in that line after the brace, you press Control Space, the ID is going to tell you what are the properties that you can configure. Nothing more, nothing less. You can only make, set those keys. And the nice thing is that since they're strongly typed, you're also going to get code completion for the possible values. Right? So the first one is a Boolean. It can only be true or false. The second one is a, is a number, and uh, you will get the right value. So the way that you create these things in a simple way is that you use a dictionary container. It's a class in Power of Monotouch. All you have to do is subclass the dictionary container class. You need to provide 
two constructors. One constructor takes an NS dictionary, and another constructor takes an NS mutable dictionary, and you chain back to the base class. Then you use these convenience methods, get XXX value and set XXS value. There's a whole collection for every possible data type. And this is what you do. This is how you implement it. Uh, this is just a snippet of the actual class. I just show a property. Um, but I'm creating my audio settings. The first two lines are boilerplate code. It's your constructor that takes a dictionary and the NS mutable dictionary. All they're doing, um, all they're doing is, oh no, all they're doing is chaining to the base class. Um, and in this particular case, it's interesting because I want you to notice that it's a nullable type. So format is a nullable type. It's a type that can optionally not be set. So the NS dictionary will automatically optimize for values that have not been set. So all you have to do is call this number, set number value, and get in32 value. And that's it. The next piece that we want to do, so that will give you everything that you need for any class that you want. This is all you have to do. You create a strongly typed class that derived from, NS, uh, from dictionary uh, container, and you can use this data type directly in your contract APIs. So you just go and replace all of those nasty NS dictionaries, and you put this data type, and now it works for you. Um, and uh, I think we just covered that. And that is the end of it, guys. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. And let me try to get Emacs with a bigger font size so I can show you stuff. Um, and remember, I'm hoping that you guys wrote a lot of stuff in, uh, oh, look at that. In your talk earlier, you mentioned that you'd added optional methods on, or optional parameters on constructors instead of just, uh, oh, instead of just creating a strongly typed wrapper around the dictionary. Is that possible when you're doing the APIs? When you're, uh, I'm sorry. So instead of creating a strongly typed wrapper around the dictionary, you said you'd enter, created optional parameters on constructors for some of the, uh, APIs in the Objective-C libraries? Uh-huh. Is that possible when we're binding these? I, I'm not sure I understood the question. So is it possible to pass just a strongly typed version? To create constructors that have optional parameters instead of? Yes. So the way that you do it, uh, OK, so let, let, me, let, me, let me set the font size. Well, I'm, I'm just going to type it here, even if it's not correct to type it here. So I'm just going I'm, I'm to put it in this file, OK? so. Um, so the way that you do that, it's, uh, let's say that you have a constructor, uh, let's say that you already have a constructor defined that does a, a, a public foo, right? And, uh, and let's say that it takes a bunch of arguments here. So that's what the, the, the class definition will generate for you, right? Um, so what you do in your extension file is that you actually uh, provide an extra constructor. So you say public foo, and then you can say things like uh, uh, int name equals, that would be a default parameter, right? Uh, int last name equals two, for example. And then you call uh, this uh, name, last name, uh, three, four, for example. Does that make sense? So, uh, so you're doing it in two stages. You're doing it in two stages. Uh, the, um, so your API definition will have the basic constructor with everything in there. Um, and then you'll have the curated version. Now. One trick that you can use is if you, if you notice that the constructor is just tremendously ugly, and it happens, every once in a while there's an API that not even its mother would love. It. Um, so what you do is you apply the attribute internal. And what that does is that it hides it from the user. So whenever you apply the internal thing, you still have access as, a develop, as the binding creator to call the method, but your users will never be able to call it. So you can do. Uh, you, can, uh, you, you can build a sausage, but you don't expose the user to the sausage making. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going, uh, let me see if I can, you know, I'm going to do it in the console because, yeah, I think that this is a, uh, is that good enough? Let me change the font to be, um, let me make that puppy like that. How do I make this active? Huh. To change the profile, you have to, you have to uh, command I. Or Here? Oh, I have to create a new one? Oh, new window, yes, okay, homebrew. Perfect. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so 
there are, actually, if you go to, um, let me show you the Mac code. Uh, The other thing is that the binding, uh, the, um, the other things is that the bindings for the Mac APIs are all open source, so you can actually you can actually learn a lot about these things. So, for example, this method was uh, was hideous. I don't remember the reason why this was hideous, um, but we decided that we didn't want to expose this to the world. So what we did is we added the internal attribute here, right? And uh, and what ends up happening is that we then create a, ver a curated version. So this is NSBezier path. So let me show you um, what we did there. So this is the objective. Uh, this is the uh, this is the curated version in uh, that we expose to users, right? This is the public method, the curated version, and you'll see that here I code the internal version that no, nobody should see ever, and then I do my uh, you know I, I deal with the sausage making there. So that that's how you would do it. Make sense? Yes? Um, about, a, about a year ago, when I first did my first uh, binding, um, I did some searching and I found something in the Mono Mac area where, you, where it would basically like Objective Sharp, Sharpie would regenerate this, the initial version of the yes. API definition for me. However, it seemed to get a little confused, like the one I was wrapping maybe had some comments in a weird places and, and it got it confused, so it had like duplicate classes in there, et cetera. Is Objective Sharpie a lot smarter now? Right, so let me, yes, so the question is, uh, there is a parser generator here uh, in source code called parse.cs, and, uh, and it's a tool that I use because I bound a lot of these APIs, so I use this tool extensively, and, there's two things. I type really fast, and I'm really good at Emacs. So to me, this tool was sufficient. But um, my friend Aaron Bockover cannot stand uh, wasted effort. So I want to point out that, it, that, that that file uh, that the parser actually said, not for using production. This is sample code. It will help you get started, but not much more than that. So it was a tool that I used, and I put it on the GitHub repo in case somebody else wanted to use it. And I. I'm always very hesitant to recommend it. A couple of uh, victims, like uh, Alex, who has, is our expert binder at Xamarin, uh, use it, but that's it. Objective Sharpie, on the other hand, doesn't use, I'm, I'm gonna show you why you want, don't wanna use this thing. This is not a real parser. This is a horrible hack. Um, let me show you this. If you find a line that has the word this, then do this, um, let me show you. Um, I mean, this is horrible. Uh, process declaration. Yeah, look at that. If the, if the code starts with add property, and if it's abstract, the, I mean, it's a horrible parser. It's a toy parser. And you always needed to audit the result. It just, it was a good scaffolding technology. So it scaffolds quickly, and then you have to audit everything. Uh, and Aaron could not accept this quality work. Um, you know, I, I was fine because it was better than what I was using before, but when Aaron comes into the team, he's like, what is this? What insanity is this? So what Aaron did is actually he built, he basically uses LVM. He uses Apple's real compiler, and he uses the internal metadata that is extracted by the compiler, the same one that will generate the code that you'll run, and that's uh, what it does. So his tool is actually precise. Mine was a horrible hack, and I apologize. In fact, I bet you that if I look at the git log for that, it probably says hack, hack, hack. Oh, no? Hack? Mm, all right. Uh, mm. Mm. All right, I guess I was not very honest, but it, it should have said <laughs> replace hack with other hack, change hack, add another hack. And if, actually, if you look at the git messages, there are things like, oh, if there's a space and you got confused, remove the space. So, not high quality stuff. So, use Objective Sharpie. That is a real tool. It's not this piece of, uh, it's not a hack. Yes. And I think I have Objective Sharpie. Uh, oh, I don't have it. So, yes. A, there's a very useful command line tool we can use inside that not app. If you really want to dive into it, the command line tool right now is way more advanced. The GUI is just. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, I'll put it up. Uh, do we have Objective Sharpie somewhere? I don't know where we put Objective Sharpie. All right, I'll find it later. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, let me take that out. But um, mm. yeah, so the, the, the full command line tool, there's a, a billion options that you can use actually with Objective Sharpie to drive the generation process. Like you can say, only give me the APIs that were added for Lion, or only give me these other APIs, or do this thing or that. You can use that in the command line tool, but the UI just gives you the basics. Is I want to bind an API, give me something quick, and it spits that out. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes, I can do that. This one? OK. Yeah. Yes, very good observation. When you see ID, you map it to NS object. You do not map it to object. The reason is because NS object actually is a subclass of object that has all kinds of interesting methods. Just like ID, ID has all kinds of interesting Objective-C methods. Like, for example, you can call the description method. You can uh, obtain the Objective-C class. So you want to you wanna bind to NS object. You don't want to bind to object. ID is bound to NS object. Very good question. Yes? Uh, uh, you're going to get a microphone so uh, everybody can hear you. I presume you're going to repost your corrected slides? Yes. I'll post the corrected slides. And then um, one other quick question. On uh, callbacks that have used select to get it to go call the right callback method, uh, is there a way to do that uh, with async reasonably well? I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. Where you, uh, the library was really written so that you passed the callback method into it uh -huh. as a string, of course, yes. and then it called back out. You just not do that callback and just use the async in this case? So the only pattern that the async attribute supports is the one that I showed. That said, a lot of there are other APIs that might have exposed a similar behavior. And in that case, what you need to do is you basically have to do the, what Microsoft prescribes in the async, uh, under async guidelines. And you would need to basically write the wrapper in that way. Uh, so, but, and Microsoft covers how to do that. Uh, this is just to get, this handles about 50% of the cases. So with this one, you get the async done for free. All right. Well, thank you very much. And don't forget to leave the piece of paper with me. So thank you very much. <laughs>